without any further any further ado, please help me in welcoming Admiral Levin Carter. Thank you very much, Admiral Chairman, and, uh, and good morning. Well, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, you know, the last time I was in this room to see one of these lectures, the guy who was coming in the lecture got arrested at the gate. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove through very slowly, and I didn't have any weapons in the car. <laughs> it makes it easier to get on the base. Um, I, I guess I should begin by saying that uh, the obvious, I, I'm not in the Navy anymore, so I don't speak for the Navy. Um, what I'll talk about are my opinions. Uh, they're opinions that I gathered while I was on active duty and working around, particularly uh, Navy combat systems, but also the research enterprise. Um, but, uh, but what I had to say doesn't represent um, the Navy's view necessarily, okay? Um, like, as uh, Emil Jarabek said, I had nine sea tours here out in Norfolk, if you count my midshipman crews on the forestall in 1975. I, I was one of the rowers. <laughs> so my heart is here on the waterfront. Um, I had plenty of duty in Washington, uh, and, and there's fun to be had up there, and it's important. Um, but it's really all about what goes on down here. And so what I found really most exciting um, was the potential, particularly in surface warfare, for uh, a lot of these innovative and new and emerging technologies to really have an impact on what you do. Um, there are really only two variables, uh, I think, and um, two top-level metrics to organizing, equipping, and training. It, really, we either try and drive capability up, or we try and drive costs down. And really, number two is only relevant in that it allows you to buy more pounds of capability, right? So it's all about getting capability up or costs down. Everything rolls up, in my mind, to one of those two metrics. So I'm going to talk a little about capability, but also in the context of mm -hmm cost and can we afford it? Because I think that, uh, again, my opinion, one of the greatest threats we face to fielding the force we're going to need in the future is our ability to buy that force and have enough pounds of capability to do what we need to do to support the national security strategy. Next slide, please. So just a couple broad themes, uh, some macro trends and the impact of those trends on affordability. Uh, and of course the centerpiece will be what we call disruptive technologies. They're just emerging. I've picked three to talk about um, And then I'll throw a wet blanket on the whole thing and, and we'll finish up with some challenges next um, Okay, first of all, there has been a lot of talk uh, in recent years about uh, China and other countries overtaking us in terms of uh, Our research the quality of our research and the volume of our research and I'm here to tell you don't believe a word uh, Certainly, other countries, and in particular Asia, uh, are growing. Their efforts are growing, and they need to be watched and respected. Next slide. But as you can see, back in 96, about 15 years ago, the total global volume of R&D was about a half a trillion dollars. And in the following oh, 10 years or so, 15, uh, it's more than doubled, over a trillion dollars in R&D. And the relative sizes of those countries is the relative volume of R&D spent. You can see the US. Uh, still spends more on R&D than all of Asia combined or all of Europe combined. Now the growth in India and China is again, it's, um, it's pretty eye-catching, um, but the quality of the research that comes out of the U.S. or is funded internationally by the U.S. and collaborated with, like uh, Andre Geim at the University of Manchester who developed uh, graphene, that was partly funded by an ONR project in its early days, uh, it's still the very best research. You have high quality, good research coming out of this country. It's going to be that way for a long time. The question is going to be whether we can continue to bank on the quality of the things we develop and the systems that we transition from that research to, to, to be sufficient to outweigh a lack in capacity, uh, the inability to afford the kinds of numbers we're going to need to do the kinds of things we say we need to do to support the national security strategy. So what's the role of disruptive technologies? Why do they matter? Why do we even talk about it? Um, this is uh, a picture of uh, who's funding research within the US. You can see that back in uh, the early 60s, uh, over two out of every three research dollars in this country 
came from the government. Uh, those were the days of the space program, uh, ICBM development, nuclear power development. Um, those must have been great days if you were the government. We had all the money. We gave it to industry and so we said, do these things for us. Now, I wouldn't say that that spawned a whole lot of innovation. It probably was the, the Chevy Corvette method to getting things done. You just add pounds of horsepower until it goes fast enough, and who cares how much gas it brings. Um, so maybe the Ferrari and the Maserati are closer to the right, more elegant engineering to get, get the job done. As you can see, we've traded places with uh, government and indus industry right now. Uh, Two-thirds of all that money comes from, come from uh, industry. Uh, now, industry places their R&D bets very different from the government, right? Uh, when, when industry places an R&D dollar down to bet on it, they want to see a return on that investment. So certainly there's more innovation to the right of that picture than the left. That's what a free market ought to look like. It's not a bad picture, it's a good picture, but there are real implications for where we get research, where we get the product of research uh, in the military, and, and how we transition um, to programs. Now on the left side, more monolithic, long-term programs to the right side, we need to be able to ride the wave of, um, of private innovation. So there are implications for how we build our systems. They need to be more open and agile. Um, and we need to be more um, willing to embrace and structured to take on um, technologies that are coming from industry, particularly with respect to computing and C4I. Uh, next page. Uh, you've all seen the sine wave of defense investment. Now, this is not just research, it's investment, so it's research um, and procurement. Um, but there's some interesting things in this picture. Obviously, we know it's coming down. Nobody knows where it's going to land. It's a dotted line in the far right. But, you know, even at the bottom of um, the worst projections, we're still right up there with, in real dollar terms, with the very highest levels of funding that have been spent on defense. There's plenty of money out there. Um, the question is, where's the money going, how are we spending it, and are we making the most of it? Um, again, those are real dollar terms. What's not on this picture is force structure. Think of what the force structure used to be back in the, in the 90s and before when we had a thousand ships. And, uh, we've got half the force structure that we had in the 90s and twice the budget. Um, there's some implications there for affordability, I would say. It's a little bit of an understatement. So if you look at that force structure, on the next slide, uh, this is from a little bit of work I did with a company called McKinsey. Um, and we pulled it apart into uh, capital assets for the Navy, that's ships, obviously, and for the Air Force uh, aircraft. And you can see that in prior cycles, when funding has gone up, generally we bought stuff, ships and tanks and planes. And when funding went down, we financed those downturns by getting rid of stuff. Decommission ships or get rid of planes, and that's how you scoop the this year money that would have been the maintenance that was laid in the budget for it, or would have been the people that were going to man those ships. That's how you pull money out uh, on a short, short term. You can see that for the first time in about 2002, those two curves diverged. The, the money went up, went up a lot, and force structure continued to go down. That's a new place. Uh, we, we've never been at a point where we're, we're tipping over in the defense budget. We're already force structure poor. We already publicly say that we don't have enough ships and tanks and planes to do the job we say we're going to need to do. We need to increase force structure. So I don't know how you square that circle, but you don't square that circle with just more money. Um, so the, the question that comes to my mind is what is the role going to be of disruptive technologies or new and emerging technologies? The word disruptive is a little overused. Next slide. So I picked three just to talk about. Um, and when it comes to directed energy or lasers and rail gun, I kind of group those together as energy weapons. Um, now, obviously, it, it, it's a cool way to shoot things uh, with directed energy, um, but it's, it's more important than that. It's, it's, what does it change? You've probably heard the term cost per shot. That's just one little piece. And when you roll in all the development and uh, integration costs in the early days, that cost per shot may not be so low. Eventually it will be. Autonomous systems, a little bit different. It's not so much I shoot something in a different way. With autonomous systems, it's much more about how will they 
how can they impact force architecture? What can you do with autonomous systems that will allow you to allocate um, your man, your expensive systems in a different way, or maybe by a different mix? And that's my opinion, not the names. Next slide. So just to start with, uh, with energy weapons, um, think about what missiles exist to do. You know, if you take a missile sitting in a magazine, it has a warhead sitting on top. And that warhead's job is to, is to explode. It's got a rocket motor sitting underneath it. Each warhead it has its own personal propulsion stack. It'll push that warhead out to a point somewhere where it can go boom and impart kinetic energy to little fragments of metal that will tear something up and destroy it and have the effect you're looking for. So think of how many times you're converting energy in that cycle. You, know, you begin with raw materials, you get trucked to a plant somewhere, or you make rocket motors, and you make missiles, and you make warheads, and you pack all that chemical energy in the form of explosives or rocket propellant uh, into these personal propulsion stacks and warheads, and you truck them around the country at great expense. You gotta keep them cold. You gotta be gentle with them. You gotta test them. Every few years, you gotta take them back to regrain the motors. Um, once you get them in the ship, think of the space that's occupied in a magazine, and what occupies that space? Mostly it's that, that Roman candle that just sits there waiting for the day when someone's gonna push a button and light it. So that it'll fly out of the magazine and take the warhead to some destination where it can go boom and impart kinetic energy to a bunch of metal. So wouldn't it be nice if we could cut out some steps in that process and, and fill up that magazine instead of filling it with personal propulsion stacks, fill it with warheads, fill it with the business end and give them enough energy when they leave the barrel or leave the rail so that they aren't gonna need that warhead or at least maybe not as much of a warhead. Now there's still a debate even in rail weapons when you, when you deliver a warhead whether we wanna augment it with um, some kind of a blast frag. You may see that in the early days, particularly when we're down around 20 megajoules of energy, uh, up to about 32 megajoules, depending on the mission, you still may need a blast of some kind and you probably will need a dispensing charge unless you're shooting a unitary warhead. Um, but think of the conga line you just cut out. When you can convert energy one time from chemical energy in the fuel tanks to kinetic energy out the barrel or through the rails. And now you have warheads containing those same fragments um, traveling at enough speed that they don't need a blast of a warhead to impart that speed to the fragments to do their job. Now, a little piece of tungsten about that size, traveling Mach 7, uh, could probably do the job you want to do if you're trying to defend yourself against, say, incoming missiles, um, or if you're doing an offensive land attack kind of mission. Um, how many of you in this room have ever shot a missile from a ship? Max range, right? We always shoot completely to max range. I don't know about you, but my experience was more like half. Yeah, right, right. Webster. Uh, you shoot in the sweet spot. <coughs> so really, before you even start, half of that Roman candle is never going to be used anyway. That's just baggage. The missile has to carry that along so it can't be used. So think of a weapon where you can dial in the range you're going to need. You can dial in the velocity, the speed you're going to need. Um, you can have scalable effects. What I'd really love to do is be able to 3D print those warheads right on the ship from raw materials. Make them as you need them. Maybe that's the 2030s. So, how many in here are uh, associated with logistics of some kind? Okay. So, think of the conga line of ammunition ships that follow our ships around um, with additional Roman candles and missiles uh, so that we can reload and replenish once everybody goes to Winchester. And if we get in a high volume shooting war, how long do we think Winchester's going to be? Probably pretty quick. So, if you can alter that flow of logistics and fill up a magazine with um, 6,000 perhaps instead of 600 warheads, right there you change the game. You change the equation. You walk the dog backwards from that effect or that impact to how you got there. All the different things that have to happen all the way back to pulling raw materials out of the ground. Um, it's a different way of looking at it, a different way of thinking, thinking of um, how you can do this. But it ultimately comes down to how many of those rounds you can afford to have and how many of those rounds you can, you can have in the magazine on station to use when you need. 
for directed energy well, before you leave this. That's laws right there. I'll say or a derivative of that. Um, so resonator chamber on the bottom for the free electron laser. I'll talk a little bit about lasers in a minute. The fire there was uh, the uh, maritime laser demo that we did about a year and a half ago out uh, uh, off San Clemente. Uh, and uh, the level of power required to do that, I won't say exactly what it was, but I'll tell you it was much lower than you might think. That was a Northrop Grumman product. It was built off a J. Hipsel laser uh, in collaboration with the Army. Um, it doesn't take much to do what you see there. Really, the, the hard science in that was the beam control and just making it all work over water. Um, you should have used an older boat. That was a brand new rib. They kept, they kept sending me videos of these <coughs> pillows bursting, and it just wasn't doing it for me. I said, send me a money shot. North of Grumman, you know, I roasted the damn boat. And, I, and then we put it on YouTube, and I got a bunch of hate mail from fishermen saying, well, this is a perfectly good boat. And they were right, but we should have used it. <laughs> but still, it made an impression. We had a couple million views on that. And there were five million views on YouTube within a very short amount of time after that, uh, what we call the world record 32 megajoules shot in the upper left corner. So what is 32 megajoules uh, with railgun? 32 megajoules, if you're a warfighter, means about 100 miles of reach if you're just doing um, a land attack. 64 megajoules will get you about 200 to 210 miles. Uh, that projectile leaves the rail at about Mach 7. Takes about 30 seconds to get up into space, about five minutes in outer space, back in and lands about 200 miles in six minutes. So you think about what the hard science is there, and it's not so much the setback forces, it's not the G-forces, particularly with rail guns, and the, and the rails are 10 meters long. So you have lots of time to shape the pulse and shape the acceleration and, and fairly gently launch the projectiles. So things like GPS inside, should be just fine. 10 to 20,000, maybe 30,000 Gs in setback. We've done that before. Um, the Raytheon uh, Ergum rounds, I think we're at about the 20,000 G range. Uh, and the science worked end to end. Uh, the program didn't work because we couldn't replicate it, but that was a producibility issue. That wasn't, that wasn't a science. They, they made that work, and it, um, hopefully it's still on the shelf. It may come back. Um, the real um, hard part is going to be the thermal management. You think of something going um, a mile a second, Mach 7, in the atmosphere, it gets pretty hot pretty fast. And then into outer space, it's going to cool down very quickly, re-enters the atmosphere. So the thermal excursions in that warhead, that's something that, that uh, is hard science. Um, and of course, directed energy is more than just shooting things. It's detecting things. It's communicating. Uh, it's all those different things you can do um, with laser energy. The scalability to me as a former ship CEO is one of the most exciting things because one of the toughest scenarios for any ship crew or commanding officer, of course, is this, the transition to hostilities. It's that time when you don't know if that ship out there is, has hostile intent or not. So if you have something that you can do short of a warning shot, which is kind of a binary, uh, and if you're being shot at by a warning shot, maybe you think it's a warning shot or maybe you think things have started, right? But if you have something that's scalable that can, that can force your adversary or potential adversary to, to, to demonstrate they have hostile intent, it really buys some of that transition space for you. It's part of the value of direct energy. You probably are pretty well acquainted with the two different flavors of direct energy right now. That, that when I talk about kilowatts, um, what's going to <coughs> see on the Ponce is going to be in the kilowatt range. Solid state lasers um, are delivering they're approaching 100 kilowatts right now. They're still under 100 kilowatts. But when you can get in high tens to 100 kilowatts, you can do damage to targets. You can shoot down things like uh, soft targets like UAVs. So again, with affordability in mind, is that why is that important? Why is that relevant? Well, if you have a system on a ship that can service a class of threat like UAVs, now you don't have to spend sea sparrows on that, on that target or standard missiles at long range. So these systems are disruptive by, in their nature, but they're not going to displace traditional systems and missiles right away. There will be a long period of time when they're complementary and transitional. And I would ask you to bear those two thoughts in mind, that these systems will be complementary and transitional for a long period of time. 
Um, the lasing medium for solid state lasers uh, typically right now is something called neodymium. Uh, that gives you a wavelength of about 1.06 microns. Not great for over water. Um, so there's some real challenges with that. Still, we can do the job. And pulling from the commercial investment, WAS leverages heavily off welding laser. Um, so let others develop your technology, adapt it to our use. Um, that's one of the model on the right side of that crisscross picture I showed you earlier. We need to get to a megawatt with direct energy if we really want to shoot missiles or, or cruise missile down. Um, so I, I doubt you're going to see megawatt direct energy from solid state technology anytime soon, maybe someday. But the, the heat, the thermal management problem gets really hard and the materials break down. Um, but megawatt is um, it's not unattainable. In fact, the Navy was shooting down cruise missiles with multi-megawatt lasers back in the 1980s using a deuterium fluoride gas laser out in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. So we've been there for 20 years. It's just, how do you get that technology on board a ship? Now, chemical lasers are not something we're going to put on a ship. That logistical conga line I described, I mean, imagine if you're trying to transfer chemicals, uh, very nasty caustic chemicals uh, that keep ships shooting. Obviously, that's not a very plausible scenario. You think an auto two fuel spill was bad. Try spilling some deuterium fluoride. The other laser, and if you ever heard me talk, you've, you've heard me talk about the free electron laser. It's a long way out. It's hard. That is hard science. But the promise of the free electron laser is it doesn't use chemicals and it doesn't use a lasing medium. You accelerate electrons in a linear accelerator. Uh, you pass them through a series of magnets called a wiggler. Very scientific term. Um, this causes the electrons to, to divert and bleed energy. This really pisses off electrons and they uh, emit photons. And those photons can be shaped and, and tuned to the wavelength of light uh, that you would like. Now, that's an oversimplification, but um, essentially that's the technology. You can, you can almost select certain wavelengths. And that's really important, because remember I said that 1.06 microns uh, in a solid state laser is not great for over water. Um, it's a high absorption area. Uh, so ideally, um, we'd like to be able to sense the atmosphere, Look at things in the atmosphere like particulates, water, fog, sand. Um, find the right wavelength, tune a laser, and shoot through the hole. And those days are a long way off, but that's one of the visions. Uh, next slide. A little bit about autonomous systems. Um, it's not as clean a line of logic in autonomous systems um, as just warheads on targets. Um, to me, the exciting promise of autonomy and autonomous systems um, is in the division of responsibilities and the division of missions. If you can really think of these things, not as a little buddy airplane that flies along and helps me, or a little buddy submarine that, that swims along and in and out of tubes, um, there's certainly lots of utility there, but if you would think perhaps in terms of um, a large swarming school of underwater vehicles or large diameter underwater vehicles that can carry packages and swim off for months at a time and behave a lot like satellites. Uh, these things are going to have to be very smart. They're going to have to be tough. They're going to have to self-diagnose and self-heal uh, to be able to do missions of long, long endurance uh, and long, long range. But once you go there, once you think about um, what they might do and perhaps offload some of those missions from your other ships or or submarines or aircraft, it allows you to maybe think of other ways of using uh, your ships and submarines and aircraft and, and perhaps the force mix. Uh, now, that sounds a little tap dancy um, because I'm not suggesting that we need to buy fewer ships or submarines or airplanes, but looking downstream, this is a for force architecture promise, uh, particularly if you can offload whole missions. Um, and again, much like directed energy and hypersonics, um, autonomous systems are complementary and transitional. It'll be a long period of time when we're going to be operating air wings that are partly manned, partly unmanned. And we're going to have underwater systems that are partly manned and partly unmanned. LCS is going to be right in the middle of that. Uh, LCS is going to be the, the platform in the middle that's going to dispense these things and use them and be the network in the center. Uh, some of the challenges, obviously we need to get power up. 
If they're going to go for long periods of time, they need to have power that lasts a long time. So the onboard power has to be managed more smartly so you don't use very much of it. Um, well, we're looking at different power systems right now that will give us months, not days, of longevity for underwater systems in particular. Uh, fuel cells, for starters. If you can push the kind of high density computing forward onto these things that, that will allow them to perform machine reasoning and think and, and execute commander's intent rather than just a series of if-then statements, now you're really unlocking some power of uh, what autonomous systems might do. And you're reducing those the lightning bolts, the communication nodes that have to come back somewhere to an operator or, or a headquarters. So someday, that's when you really start to see the promise of autonomous systems. Now, there's some ethical issues there. Are we going to let them make decisions? Are we going to let them make life and death decisions? Um, you know, those are decisions that people like you are going to have to figure out. Um, I would argue that you know if you launch a Tomahawk, uh, you just sent off an autonomous system that's going to go do what it's going to do. Uh, you finished giving it instructions. I mean, some now today we can continue to communicate with. But once you send off a warhead, you send an autonomous system off to go execute your intent. So culture's the last line there on that slide, and to me that's one of the highest obstacles. And uh, that's why I'm really delighted to see some of the younger faces in this crowd, because uh, you're the ones who are going to be making that change and changing that culture. Not because old people like Admiral Jarevic uh, don't want to usher in change, um, but change is hard, particularly in the military. And we're very comfortable with what we know. We don't want to change it overnight, nor, nor should we. But as we think of emerging technologies and disruptive technologies, think complementary and transitional, especially in our lifetimes. Uh, next slide. Um, OK, the promised wet blanket. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Gardner hype cycle. They put this out uh, about every year. The print's pretty small, but you can pull it up online and take a look at it. Um, the two important sections here are the peak of inflated expectations. I would say for most of what we think of as disruptive te technologies, the things that are coming, um, probably in that category right now. There's something they'll be able to do. We all have pretty wild expectations for what we want them to do, and somewhere in between is the reality. Um, followed by the trough of disillusionment. I would just say the trough of disillusionment doesn't have to be that way. We manage expectations smartly. We do uh, informed experimentation, the kind of work that's being done at NWDC and Fleet and ONR, um, so that we have realistic expectations. We budget to them and we execute, we stick with them, uh, and don't go on to the next bright, shiny object. That trough doesn't have to be there the way it's depicted in this picture. Um, the only technology that I've talked about that's specifically one of those data points is uh, autonomous vehicles is about halfway up on the left side. Um, but I would say if, if I were going to put directed energy on there, it's probably on the left side. Railgun? Uh, I would put a railgun a little further to the right. Um, that technology is maturing rapidly. The science um, the program to, to understand what's going on and understand the science so that we can hand it off to developers um, has progressed uh, remarkably well. And, and one of the things I always appreciated about that program was that it was never overpromised. They had realistic goals, and they were delivering right on every single one. The assistant program manager for that, uh, Captain Mike Ziv, is the NAVC program manager that's going to catch that pass when we throw it forward. So it's set up for transitional success. I hope it keeps its momentum up. Next slide. Last slide. So think capability, uh, think uh, of these capabilities as complementary and transitional. Uh, we're not going to flip a switch tomorrow and make manned aircraft obsolete. There will be important missions for submarines and aircraft and ships for as long as any of us are, are out there walking around. The, the force mix may change. I think the more we can think in innovative ways about how we would distribute missions across that force mix, the more we can unlock from the potential that exists in all disruptive technologies. Um, but they'll be complementary and transitional for, for a long time. And really, that's harder. You know, when you have a flight deck uh, that everybody knows how to work, everybody understands that ballet, uh, and suddenly you introduce autonomous systems or unmanned aircraft into it, You've all seen the videos, I'm sure, of the X-47B. Um, 
that transition space is the harder part. It's the more dangerous part. Um, technology isn't the long pole. Not always. Much of what I've just rattled off, and these are just three I've, I've pulled out to talk about, um, is pretty well understood. Laws is based on very mature welding laser technology. You combine those beams incoherently, um, and just by brute force you can get enough energy on target to have a destructive effect. Um, but there's not a lot of new science there. As you jack up the power, we push that edge, as we should. But technology is holding us back. So why does the valley of death exist? We've all heard of the valley of death, I'm sure. Um, it's a cultural thing. It's a transition thing. If, uh, if I'm building programs of record, um, I don't have money in my budget to introduce this new risky technology. We have to think about that differently. Um, transitional and complementary capabilities. Uh, if we want to be able to afford and unlock uh, what these technologies can do for us. Um, so now's the time to be thinking about tactics, techniques, and procedures. Directed energy, that's a hard one. It's going to be people like you in this room that are going to figure that out. Uh, even know what the law says about that. You know, we've signed treaties that says we won't we won't burn eyeballs out with direct energy, and certainly we wouldn't want to do that. Um, but how do you make sure you know? How do you develop the tactics? How do you develop a, a system that um, will do what you want it to do and won't do what you don't want it to do? Um, so changing the culture. Now's the time. Don't wait till these things are in your face and out there. Now's the time to be thinking and writing and discussing um, how the tactics would evolve, how we would use things like this differently. Uh, the people in Washington in particular need to hear what you out here have to say about that, the operators, um, so that that's a rich and lively conversation. It's a great forum for So at the end of the day, I'll, I'll finish kind of where I started, which was if we just keep buying what we're buying and building what we're building, we have some magnificent systems out there. SM3 is a wonderful weapon, but at 10, 15, 20 million dollars a copy, you need to be able to use that when you need to be able to use that, which means you need to have enough of them, which means you need to be able to service other classes of targets in a layered approach, uh, <coughs> depth of fire, so that you can save your golden BBs for when you really need them. Complementary and transition. Take questions if you have. <laughs> All right, thanks, sir. I'm going to ask the first question. You know, being an old guy, never hearing the term upset yeah. electron or Jimmy whatever Sam. you called it there, do his photons and everything. Slide number six, upset me. And that was a slide that talked about our inventory compared to our investment. And I looked at that for a couple minutes, trying to figure out if there was any logic to, okay, we increased our investment to increase our inventory. But it seemed to be converse to that. What? How, how do we explain that? How do we fight that? How do we correct that? Because in my book, you know, being an old guy again, that's just wrong. I mean, our, our investment now is, is you know, way out of whack to what our inventory is, as was, you know, our, our, our airplanes. So what are your thoughts on that, sir? Um, well, I'm not going to say and guess how budgetary decisions get made. The job in Washington is very hard. And it's not just a Navy picture, that's a government picture. Things have gotten very expensive. Um, you remember back in, um, in the early 90s, we, we had almost 600 ships, right? We were on path to 600 ships. And if you had told me back in those days that the Navy was going to have a $130 billion or pick a number budget, I mean, we all would have been dancing in the aisles. So something clearly has changed, and and I wouldn't put that in the disruptive technology category. It's not really my swim lane. Um, I did resources back in D.C. Uh, for a while, and I'll just tell you it's a tough environment, and I wouldn't say it's optimally structured. Um, but there are a lot of people looking at how we can um, alter the acquisition system, uh, acquisition professionals. I was not one. I was an operator. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to answer your question other than to, to, to jump on with you and highlight it as one of the big threats we have is that uh, we need to be able to, we government, need to be able to figure out how to 
buy the things we need to buy without costs just continuing to go up and up and up. Um, I think it's a fair question to say, where did the money go? What was it spent on? That'd make an interesting analysis. Some of it was still war, um, but those pictures didn't include OCO um, or the supplemental. A lot of it is the cost of people. Um, people have gotten very expensive and people are the biggest chunk of the budget. But then again, that's, that kind of leads you right back to, okay, if I want to attack those costs, we all know we want to reduce manning, reduce people. How do we use some of these technologies to do that? An autonomous system, um, augmenting and complementing man systems maybe is the way to do that. Thanks, sir. Any other questions? Okay. Do you see a good question from online, sir? Is it what? Is it what are some of the changes to culture? So what are some of the changes to culture at the younger, so to speak? Um, well, any time you, you introduce technologies that are radically different than what we're all used to, uh, there's going to be a cultural shift. There's going to be cultural resistance um, and excitement. Think of that hype cycle. There's going to be misunderstanding. Um, and so it's pretty hard to shape tactics, techniques, and procedures in culture when you don't really know where that's all going to go. Um, but now's the time to, to have that conversation because you can shape those requirements. You, know, you particularly the younger folks in this audience, um, can, can push the possibilities and think in terms of how you would execute a mission if you had certain systems or certain capabilities instead of waiting for those capabilities to roll out of a production line somewhere and then fashion tactics around them. Uh, so both directions in that conversation are important. But now, particularly with um, crowdsourcing and some of the crowdsourced uh, online games uh, that, uh, that are coming out, we can take that conversation and enrich it immeasurably compared to what that might have been in the past. And it's important because the rate of change is changing so fast. Uh, you know, what was unimaginable just a few years ago uh, it's going to be old hat in a couple of years. That train is moving so fast. I mean, how, how many of you here have a, a Jurassic iPhone 1? Probably nobody. Uh, and things are going to be changing and turning over that quickly, especially when you think of that, the crisscross research slide shows the market driving who's, who's investing in what when it comes to technology. So we're going to have to keep up with it. And it's not so much about a point solution about go out and change the culture tomorrow. Let's change the way we talk about the culture and change the way we, we push the technology we want based on what um, what you know the possibilities to be or imagine the possibilities to be. Right. Got a question from Commander Salazar. Sir, Ben Salazar. Morning, sir. Ben Salazar here. Uh, in your slide, you just touched on it about the research and development investment swapping between industry and government. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, as you as you <coughs> talked about Moore's law, but also our acquisition system being pachydermic. Um, with technology accelerating, how do you think our, ac our uh, acquisition system should be changed to account for that so that we can incorporate new disruptive technologies more readily? Because our peers, are, our competitors, are not restrained by that. Right. Um, so a question I used to get a lot was, um, hey, why can't we be more like you know who. Just pick something and spend a lot of money on it and go that way. And and that's the totalitarian model. That's a, you know, where someone just says, this is where we're going, this is what we're going to spend money on, and, and, and go make it happen. But you better be right if you're going to do that. And I would say that was more of the Soviet model. There was not probably not a lot of online war games in the old Soviet Union. I, I liken the way our research happens more to the, uh, uh, the free market. And for all its Brownian motion and all its pushback and forth and its inefficiency, it's pretty healthy. And it tends to give us a pretty good solution. Um, if you knew you were going to bet right, then dispense with all that, pick a winner, put all your money there, and, and go. But I don't think any of us is that smart. So it's not so much an unhealthy model. I, I think there's there's goodness in it. But to get to the first part of your question, how do we how do we 
how do we keep up with that? That's open architecture. Those are open systems. Um, another overused term like disruptive technologies, but we need to build systems in an open enough way so that we can affordably introduce new technologies as they emerge and new missions. When Aegis cruisers went to sea, um, they were a magnificent ship. I was on Thomas S. Gates. We were just, we couldn't believe we had a 20 mile missile and a Spy 1A radar. Nobody that day was thinking, you know, maybe we'll shoot ballistic missiles down someday with this stuff. Yet it evolved, and it wasn't a cheap evolution. Um, but my point is that there are, there are missions, there will, be, there will be missions that will evolve that maybe we're not even thinking of today. And there'll be other missions that we think of as core missions that may fundamentally change, um, and we need to be able to adapt our systems to keep up with that. LCS is a step in that direction. You know, LCS isn't about pulling in on Wednesday and pulling out on Friday and, and changing your hat from line of warfare to surface warfare. It's, it's more about being able to develop, to keep up with technology in a module um, to adapt uh, rather than taking the whole ship and putting it in a shipyard for a year and taking it down to shiny bare metal and upgrading it and bringing it back out a year later. You can do all that in a module that you can crane aboard a ship and maybe in a week or two upgrade capability. And so if you look at the life cycle of that ship, and all those one-year overhauls that hopefully they won't have to have. And the ability to keep flowing technology to the ship in a modular fashion based on an open architecture. Um, think of the ace of you gained over the life of that ship and the money you saved. So that, that sort of, the short answer would be just an open system. There are challenges with that. Um, security, for one. Um, and I would say this is that's one of the big jobs of the warfare centers and our, in our uniform technical community. They need to rule that space. They need to own the interfaces and, and rule that space in between uh, systems that we bring in and the open architecture that's in our ships and planes. Good morning, sir. Uh, Megan Schoenberg, I'm the ONR Science Advisor here at NWTA. Well, I have a question for you. So if industry is so far ahead of us in the technology curve and the technology growth. What's ahead of us? Industry, as far as that curve you showed, is industry and the research and the amount of money that they're putting towards it. And if you look at the curve of technology growth for information technology, we're really accelerating exponentially. And industry gets a jump on us because they don't have the same acquisition cycle that we have and some of the limitations that we have. So if they're so far ahead of us, does, is it good for us to start developing future concepts and thinking about those future technologies and where they're headed with that exponential growth? so that we can start building requirements and get ahead of that curve and maybe start building our cycle so that we're, our requirements are there and ready when the technologies are actually ready for us to purchase. And I wouldn't say industry is ahead of us. Industry is spending more money than the government when it comes to who's investing in technology, but it's largely the same technology. We just have to be able to pull from it um, based on somebody else's investment. Um, and, and have an agile enough platform to, to bring it in, in stride. Um, it's not like they have technology that we have. It's not a they and us. It's industry supports all of us. I do think we probably need to have a more um, interactive conversation with industry about those technologies. Um, when I was a commander, I was the uh, Aegis uh, sponsor. Uh, back then it was OpNav N865G. And even back then, we were saying, gosh, you know, nobody does ADA anymore. And Yuck 43s were just going to replace the mighty Yuck 7 that had all the computing power of, well. Uh, and, you know, we'd sit around and think, well, we're going to picture a day when we're driving around the streets of Morristown in the middle of the night looking for old guys leaning on lampposts with five o'clock shadows saying, hey, do you, do you know ADA? <laughs> um, those days are, are gone when we can dictate and, and own a system and make it monolithic and proprietary and keep it forever. I mean, that's, this is well known, you know. You know. So um, we just have to be constructed on the inside to embrace technologies as they evolve. A lot of people know that. And it's nothing I figured out. Um, and they recognize it. It's just how do you, how do you really do that? And the submarine community, Archie, took a stab at that. Um, when they build submarines, uh, they know that if they, if they install computers, in the time it takes before the submarine is finished and the thing is launched, 
um, those computers will be obsolete. So why install those computers? Let's just wait. Let's just build a ship and, and put them in later. Um, so there are just ways we need to think about uh, keeping up. So those were just three quick squirts. Uh, I tried to throw in a little bit of uh, background technology, uh, where it's all coming from. I'm a passionate believer in, and I think what the power of these important technologies can do for us. Um, are they disruptive? You bet. Um, but that doesn't mean they're misunderstood. Uh, I think what we really need to be thinking about is the tactics and the culture and the procedures. And as those of you in this room grow up and become the cruiser CEOs and the battle group commanders and the program managers in Washington, we ought to be thinking about how do we pull things in. Thanks. Well, thank you, sir, and um, your ability today to bring this together. The purpose of these talks is to get people thinking and being creative and not necessarily coming up with the next innovative idea, but thinking about how, how it all comes together. What really captured me was the entire logistics tale that you put together and pulled together that missile piece for us. Just another way to think about this. Thing. So, again, sir, thank you very much for today. We've got one of the uh, most coveted icebergs we have here for, today, for you today. But again, thank you very much for being here, sir. All right, we'll turn about as fair play. I never was much of a guy for coins when I was at ONR, but I have a few leftover things that I had made while I was there. And equally coveted is the Naval Research Pocket Protector. Wear <laughs> 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 pride, but be careful because people will, will mug you. 